and welcome to Don't Die Before You're Dead. I am your host, Mary McCartney, and this is where we talk about all things related to living the life that you were meant to live. Not to wait, not to put it off, but to act now while you still can. Of all things, you want to avoid living in the land of regret. So today, I have a fabulous guest who has just done exactly that, and I am so um, inspired by her because she has make, taken a big leap that many of us might want to do, but are afraid to do. So without much further ado, and I'll let her share her life with you, I'd like to welcome Anita Watkins. And by way of introduction to say that I discovered Anita through a group that I had joined and found out what a fabulous photographer she was. And I have had more comments about my pictures on my website mm -hmm. from people who, Anita, they're just they say it speaks volumes and you've captured my personality, whatever it's worth, and uh, you are so good at what you do. But you have not always been a photographer. So let's take a look at what you've been doing in the meantime and how you transition. So welcome, Anita, and thanks for taking the time to join me. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm so excited to, to share my story, and I think what you do is so important, and we all need this inspiration. Thank you. Yes. And I know that you've inspired me greatly. So let's share that with others who might be too afraid to, to take a different direction, if you will. And so now what can you say to them about your journey? What have you done? So um, I did some photography when I was a teenager and um, I'd taken a whole bunch of courses and fell in love with it. And I've always been passionate about it as an art form. If I go to a museum, I always want to go to the photograph section. I don't really care about the paintings <laughs> as much as I care about the photographs. Uh -huh. um, fell in love with Karsha's work um, and, and I just loved it. But it never occurred to me that I could actually earn a living doing it. And I pursued science. I went to university and I ended up with a master's in clinical biochemistry and um, loved the journey, but decided that I wasn't a researcher, that that wasn't gonna be my path. And my path was education. I loved um, learning and sharing what I had learned. So I ended up becoming a, a high school science teacher. I was a chemistry and biology teacher for 27 years and uh, loved the classroom, loved the kids. I was oh. very grateful for the profession and for people that aren't in Canada. Um, teachers are well respected, well paid, we have great benefits. It's a fantastic profession. And, and it was more, sorry, it was more social than the research labs maybe? Um, no, not, not necessarily. Social. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, just smaller groups. Smaller yeah, groups. okay. Um, yeah, no, I, I worked, I was part of, um, the interesting thing when I was a scientist was that, um, a lot of labs will partner up with other labs so that you don't risk that kind of isolation because oh, great. It's, it's great for mental health, but it's also yes. great for science mm -hmm. to try and collaborate with other labs. So my own daughter is a scientist and she's in a, in a large group of labs and oh, so they okay. have regular meetings and so, so they can network. So there's a lot of networking in science. It's actually a lot of fun. It's not really? quite as, I, I am yeah, so it's not like the movies. I'm about the farthest place you can be away from science. I mean, I'm the English and, and business end of it. Um, so my my ignorance about science is showing, I'm afraid, Anita. So anyway. <laughs> no problem. Well, I'm happy to dispel that. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it was, it was great and I was grateful for it, but I decided that that wasn't going to be my path for the next few decades. And uh -huh. education was fantastic to me. I got along great with the staff, with students, um, was involved with extracurricular. Uh, coached debating, coached field hockey, did all kinds of things. So um, uh, worked a lot with social justice, uh, both at the board level and students, um, which was probably, that was the highlight of my career and uh, lots of incredible opportunities for professional development. But after about 27 years, the stuff that you love about that career becomes very easy. It's very yeah. automatic. Like I could roll out of bed and the time from my feet were in the bed to my feet were on the floor, I could have three awesome lesson plans in my head <laughs> for the day. <laughs> I was just, it was so automatic and they would right. be original and engaging. And that part, which I used to spend hours and hours on because I had built up that skill set was very automatic. Right, right. You had classroom to management. Story. Yeah. Yeah. And my classroom management skills were on point and, you know, the, the easy, the, the, the fun stuff was was very easy and the hard stuff the marking will never get easier <laughs> it never <laughs> does tell me. <laughs> <clears throat> and the politics uh -huh. and you know, yeah all of that started to occupy more of my brain space and yes. so um 
I was starting to get a little bit frustrated and antsy and, and withdrawing a little bit. Um, not in the classroom. The classroom was always my happy space and my safe yes. space. Yeah. Um, but it was starting to take its toll on me. And uh, my oldest child was heading off to university. So I was starting to face the whole empty nest thing, which was, mm -hmm. you know, and my strategy for coping with that kind of thing is just to throw myself into stuff. Like I just <laughs> get busy, myself. get busy. And yeah. uh, my middle child wanted to audition uh, for um, local theater and needed the headshot. So I said, well, you know, I love photography. I have this really good camera. I just recently finally got a digital camera. I'd only been shooting film until then. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, so let me try. I'm happy to pay for a professional, but I wouldn't mind trying. So I researched um, headshots. And at the time, most of them were truly horrible. But there was <laughs> one style that, that kept calling out to me. And it was all by mm -hmm. the same person, this guy out of New York City by the name of Peter Hurley. And um, so I played around and I did her headshots and she loved them and um, she used them. And, and I went back and, and looked at his work just at the, I think at the very end of June, at the end of the school year. So I thought, well, I'm just, you know, look at his work. And I saw he was offering an online course starting July 1st. Oh, awesome. It was his very first online course. Wow. And it was, I remember it was, I think it was $800, which to me with a kid going off to university and being a teacher, I thought like that just yeah. seemed like a huge amount of money to, to throw away. So I when was that? Sleep. <laughs> when was that, that, Anita? Um, I think it was seven years ago. Wow. Cause online courses are like, everybody's, you know, they're in their face. It right was now, his first, yeah. It must've been and just think, the beginning of all of that, eh? I think what it was is that a lot of people, when they do it the first time, they're afraid to ask for the real value. Yes. And it was his very first one. So, okay. um, so I lucked out and I couldn't sleep for three nights. Like I was so, <laughs> I, I was just so taken with this. I just, I said yeah. to my husband, I said, I think I'm supposed to take this course. And he's like, well then take it. I said, no, no, no. I said, you don't understand. I said, if I take it, I'm going <laughs> all in. <laughs> and he's like duh of course yeah. it's you are. <laughs> like, be warned <laughs> yeah and and I just knew that that I was going to to try and learn enough that I could be a pro and it was just a very sudden decision and I threw myself into it and within a just over a year I had um, developed a portfolio that allowed me to become associate under his new program where I was up against people who'd been shooting for, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 oh. years professionally, and they didn't get Fantastic. in. Fantastic. Wow. And That's so, amazing. Like, I worked, so I worked really hard and I had the yeah. eye, like I already had the eye and I had some of the technical background from the past. Like it, it's not like I started off cold because mm -hmm. as a teenager, I had studied it. I'd taken a number of courses at the local college and um, I, you know, I did have that foundation. But can but, you learn, can you learn the eye for design, for pictures, for composition? Is that technically learnable, if that's a word? Uh, or is it something that just your creative nature and your, your gift, your talent is to be able to see what others might not see? I think it's a little of both. I think I've always had the eye. Um, I think I've always had that eye. Like I've, I have a strong sense of graphic design. I have you know mm -hmm. it's just something I've always had mm -hmm. um but I do know people who who don't have it naturally who can who can learn like maybe not to you know any Leibovitz level yeah <laughs> um, okay but but who can have a successful career that you know it is possible um but I think it's a little of both I think some of it you can learn because there are sort of rules and tips and strategies mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. you can use and implement but that that decision of when to press the shutter like that's yeah. a decision right yes. and and that's connected to like i'm just waiting waiting and i you know it's microseconds in some cases it's not but it's just that that difference between this and that mm -hmm. it's powerful right and especially in the case of branding photos it's it's important to catch that that little in between moment mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. that's the magic moment that that is the most useful for a client so um and the same thing is true for portraits right it's the um it's important to to, to know when to click. So yeah, I think some of that is, that's the art part, but there's also the science part, the tech part. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a combination, you need both. Um, and then if you're running a business, you need to have the business sense too, right? Well, so correct, it's kind yes. of all of the, all of the above. Right, 
And so how did you develop the business sense if you're in teaching? Because that's not necessarily a component of teacher education. At least it wasn't part of mine. I sort of went into teaching later. So I had some of the business and that allowed me to become a you know head of business at one school I was at. But it's not something that was part of my formal education to be a teacher. So you developed that. You have a natural instinct there for knowing how to do business. I, I just worked at it. I had very, very early on, I had heard somewhere, and I, I can't remember the source of it. I wish I did. So I had heard somewhere that if you want to do this and you want to make a go of it, you must spend as much time working on the business side as you do on the photography side. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a mistake of a lot of photographers. They think, you know, the vast majority think if I put up beautiful pictures, people will fall in love with yeah. my beautiful pictures. If I build it, they, they will come. <laughs> exactly. And, and they won't. Yeah. They won't. So at so, what point did you transition then? You you said July you started the online course. You said a year later that you had been um, taken on or part of the association there. So a year later, at what point were you able to say, uh, to make the transition and say, you know, I, I have to make a move to this new career because it's calling me? Well, I was fortunate in that... Um, family was super supportive and my initial studio was actually in my basement <laughs> and I had carved out a little section there so I had started off with headshots um, and so that was fairly easy to do and I could do location like family shoots I did that as well and um, I did that part-time a little bit on the side while I was teaching full-time and I don't know how <laughs> I still had yeah, two kids so that's not a big enough load <laughs> yeah and teaching <laughs> yeah. yeah and and teaching is like one and a half jobs as far as the amount of time that it takes. It's not, you know. Correct. Yeah. So um, I did eventually um, do part time and uh, part time as a high school teacher is two thirds. Right. And so then I had a little bit more time to to pursue the idea of the business and mm -hmm. it started to go well. And then I had reapplied for part time and my principal um, wouldn't approve it. Um, so I had to work full time while I had a business in a studio. And, oh. um, so then I decided he did say I could, um, take a leave in the second semester. So I ended up, I took a full leave. I decided, um, you know, if I'm going to be teaching full time in the first semester, I would just take a full leave in the second semester and try it. That was mm -hmm. my, my leap of faith. And again, I, I can't pinpoint that it was a moment. I think it was maybe just the, the frustration of, of how things had, had come down. I mm -hmm. don't know if I would have necessarily had the courage that year to jump in full time. Um, it was always kind of a, a thought, like maybe, maybe if I reach sort of this level, but uh -huh. it's hard. Like when I was doing both jobs, I, can I only loved imagine. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I loved it, but it's hard. It's hard to yeah. do either one of them well, right? Like it's hard to do either one of them well if you are your head, you know, your feet are in both areas, and right. so. Um, it was interesting because the very first day of second semester, when I took my full leave of absence for a semester, I was on a plane to Las Vegas to one of the world's biggest photography conferences. Oh and my. I met um, in person, finally, uh, three of my very good friends that I had met on that online course. We had stayed friends, but we had never met in person. We chatted every day and, you know, mm -hmm. really awesome support. And so my very first day of full time, I'm flying to Vegas. I meet my photography friends. I'm at a conference. And while I was in the plane, I got five headshot bookings. And it oh. just felt, yeah, that's the woo-woo side of me is I'm a scientist well, by training, but it's like, that's a sign. <laughs> that's a sign, yes. I mean, I, you know, like I'm not a big fan of coincidences. I think things that happen are relatively meant to be and people cross your path for either your reason or theirs. And so, yeah, that's a big neon flashing in the plane, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it was like, okay, I'm going to be okay. That'll, you know, help to support me for this month. <laughs> yeah. Um, and on the first day. And because I had a uh, rent to pay for my studio, so I had expenses. Um, so that just put me, and then by the end of that week, I was, uh, yeah, I can do this. I can do this. And I think within a couple of weeks, I would put in a request for a full leave of absence the following year. Wow. Or I guess I guess within a month of that, probably, um, I decided I was going to do it. And so that was three and a half years ago. 
and uh, it's been incredible and I have zero regrets. Um, well, you just got a new studio, right? I, yeah, I had like, I had the upstairs space. Um, I've been there this, uh, this December, it'll be five years um, in the upstairs space, but the downstairs space uh, came open and in the middle of COVID, I'm like, I'm taking it. <laughs> Good for <laughs> you. Faith. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't well, working, but I took it. <laughs> excellent. Well, so, Alina, people are afraid to do what you've done. And I, I think in terms of how you've managed it, going, you know, not all in, but have, and, and you've worked hard. And I know there's a sort of a sense out there that people are becoming more afraid of hard work as you know society moves through the years that you know the old years of toiling hard to get what you want seems to be a bygone philosophy you embrace that you worked hard like i know how hard teaching is to do all the in class and outside of class stuff i mean that's hours and hours and hours that people don't understand marking takes forever and yet you had a side business and you were willing to do that to get where you are today so you're definitely not an overnight success and you've worked hard what would you say to people who are sitting with a dream today that are afraid how would you how would you urge them to be bold enough to look into doing it i mean you looked into it with the first online course so what would you so say to them so I, there's a few things I, that just have popped into my head. One is this concept of luck. So I know that there are, are people who look at me and think, oh, she's so lucky. And I've had people say that, oh, she's so lucky. And no question. I mean, I'm a white woman in Canada. I have a supportive family. Like there's so many things that I have that other people don't. Uh -huh. um, and so I own all of that. But I think we, we have the power to create our own luck and people don't recognize that. So one of the things with luck, and there've been studies that have done this, is that <clears throat> luck is, is being ready and constantly scanning for opportunities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just to be aware that, and to be able to recognize these opportunities. So the kinds of things that I've done and, and, and achievements I've had and things that I've tried in my photography career, and also in my teaching career, yes, I've, I've been lucky, to have noticed the opportunities, but everyone else had access to those opportunities and they chose not to take them. And one that's the, things, the difference. One of the things, now you being a science person and me totally not, I could be you know, speaking to somebody that's uh, well ahead of the game here, but I did learn through that process of the reticular activation in our, like our, our retinal uh, acuity, if you will, that you don't see a yellow car until you buy one. Mm -hmm. So, it's the awareness it's the consciousness so yes. like people might scratch their head and say well you started an online course in july and you're flying off to to vegas how did you know about that conference how were you aware of it but you've just said that you know we need to become more conscious and look for the signs if you will and, and there are opportunities for sure but we don't see things because we're not maybe as as aware or, or as conscious as we need to be. Does that make sense? Totally. And I think that's the truth. There's a famous study where they put, um, uh, they gave a newspaper to, um, to subjects and they had asked them before they did the particular, it was a psychology experiment and they had asked them, um, do you consider yourself to be lucky or not lucky? And mm -hmm. so that was the question beforehand. And then they gave them this newspaper and they told them to count the number of times that something appeared in the paper. I don't remember exactly what it was. You can look it up, but uh, they had to go through this section of the paper and count the number of times. Well, I think like the second, third or fourth, like very early on in the section, there was a full page ad that they had inserted that said, if you are part of this study, you can stop now. You don't need to count. Just go and tell the person that you saw this ad and you will get an extra hundred dollars for participating in this. Okay. So the people who thought that they weren't lucky went and did the task exactly as assigned. The people who considered themselves lucky had a much higher likelihood of noticing that ad, uh. catching it and getting the extra hundred dollars. 
Interesting. So it's that, it's that being aware. It's, it's like, to me, it's like the peripheral vision, right? So yeah. the, the laser focus has its, has its purpose. Laser focus mm -hmm. can be awesome, but you also have to have that peripheral vision. And just in that little exercise, the lucky people notice, and it wasn't hidden. It wasn't like a little tiny thing. It was like a full <laughs> page, very noticeable if you weren't laser focused on the task. Right. And so that was sort of, you know, one of the studies that started addressing, you know, what is luck? You know, it's not some supernatural thing that we actually are in charge of our own luck. That's a good, that's a really good point. So for those people who are feeling frustrated and not seeing the opportunities, I guess the message is, where are you looking? And well, th in the case of the newspaper, it was right there in front of them, <laughs> but they were so focused, right? So right. it's being, I think it's that, it's almost like a playful energy and exploring your curiosity and just being less fearful. Mm -hmm. and, and that's hard, right? Like fear is a tough thing and it's paralyzing. And when you were asked the question originally, I was thinking about um, something that my, my mom who has passed away, um, one of her best friends had shared a story with me that her, her best friend was in her 40s and she really wanted to be a nurse and she was afraid. And so my mom said to her, you know, if you sign up and you go through, what will happen in five years? Mm -hmm. She said, well, I would be a nurse. And then she said, well, what would happen in five years if we don't sign up? You'll be five years older. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Like it's just yeah. simple as that. And, and just that it's okay. I think people are afraid of failure. And I think that maybe that's a scientist's way of thinking. Scientists don't think in terms of failures. Everything we do is an opportunity to learn something about ourselves. Right. right. My journey through this has not been linear. It's been, <laughs> you know, like it's been, it's overall yeah. the trajectory has been. But you've accepted there's that. Been, yeah. And that's okay. There are things that I've done that, you know, were not successful. Marketing campaigns that didn't work money that I wasted but it's not a failure it taught me something but not I think exactly. that's really important yeah but not exactly wasted as you come out of the other side with some takeaways but you're right I think fear holds people's feet in place and you know that's a good question what will happen if you do what will happen if you don't um I'm very much in favor of living large today. Uh, I've seen and heard too many people that got in their senior years and saw the finish line not too far away and realized that, you know, their one life, their own, they own their one life, that they actually relinquished it to the desires of others and they're sitting there with regrets. And as much as we don't live alone, most of us, we do have other people in our lives. At the end of the day, it's still us that has to look back on our personal life and say, did I, leave, did I live the life I was meant to? And I so admire the fact that you, you saw, you learned, you felt, you obviously had family support. But I think a lot of us have support, but we don't know it because we don't ask for it. Exactly. Do you think that's fair? I think Just that's maybe. very fair. Yeah. Yeah. And people, and people will borrow our enthusiasm and confidence as well. So mm -hmm. no question. I'm very fortunate to have the kind of support I do. And I have friends who don't have the kind of support that, that I do. And, and I feel for them. But the other thing about, about fear that that's, again, this is my sort of scientific training coming in, but there's a quote I came across, which physiologically makes perfect sense. And, and it's the idea that fear is excitement that forgot to breathe. The way our body reacts at a physiological level, the adrenaline rush, the, the nerves, the shakes, mm -hmm. all of that, that entire physiology of our body, whether it's fear or excitement, our body reacts the same way. And wow. one of the things that I look at is that if I'm feeling that fear, I literally take a deep breath and I just check myself. Is this more of like that roller coaster feeling or is this fear for my safety and security? Mm -hmm. And more often than not, the fear is actually just excitement and being able to breathe through it can help you recognize that. And I think a lot of people misread fear and they, they, um, they just misread it. They think that the, what they're feeling is fear. In reality, it's excitement. 
I was afraid to sign up for the online course, but I was more excited than yes. afraid. Right. Well, so wait. yeah, fear of failure and so on. But but physiologically, that rush, that 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 feeling that we have of of being on edge and so forth, it's the same thing. So I think a lot of people don't realize that and misinterpret their excitement as fear. That when you're saying that, it kind of reminds me of the idea of that in nutrition, you know, we think we're hungry when in reality we're thirsty. So, yep. you know, we need to teach our bodies, I guess, how we're responding. And you talk about that pause. It seems like most of us are so busy flying through life. We're on that hamster wheel and we don't pause. We don't look around. We don't become really conscious of what's going on. And at what point are people going to become conscious when they're 75, 80, and their bodies are telling them they can't do things because they weren't keeping mobile? Or earlier, I mean, obviously, you transitioned into a passion at a much earlier age because of your awareness. Now, what was it that, that kind of got you on that online course? Like, what was that first indicator that you were looking outside your current situation? Is there something that you, you, you could share with somebody that would say, if this is happening to you, wake up. <laughs> I know that's a little harsh, but you know, yeah. you woke I, up. I, I woke up. I, it was just such a strong feeling. It was, and, and there's no way to explain it. Like it just, I had just seen the offering. I was, you had finished marking all my exams, submitted my marks. I was cleaning and getting ready for the summer break. I should have had, you know, a couple of months mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. to enjoy my family, to catch up on my health, you know, on my rest and exercise and so on. And instead I threw myself into this course and I, I wish I had an answer, but I think we just have to listen to ourselves. Like I, it, to me, it just, made the most sense it was just something I had to do and and to I felt it so strongly I I've always loved photography I've been the family photographer I've always had people tell me that my photos were beautiful I could go into a business you know so mm -hmm. I guess that seed had been there planted there already mm -hmm. um but I guess I never imagined that I could do it and that it was that it was possible to have a successful business and so that summer I started listening, I think, because it was that summer where I, I figured out if I'm going to do this, I have to learn business as well. And <laughs> I started listening to a particular podcast um, that was all about the business of photography and that, you know, transformed my thinking as well. And I, I think it's just one of the things I heard somewhere is that the idea is to follow your curiosity. I think this notion that, you know, some of us will have this grand plan you know, here and we'll make every step and plan to it. But many of us follow our curiosity. So mm -hmm. I kind of fell into high school teacher. Um, I, was, I was not a big fan of high school myself. I you mean um, as a student? Didn't, as a student, yeah. And I was not, I didn't really like teens when I was a student. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, like a, it wasn't my thing. So the fact that I ended up teaching in a high school is, is actually really funny. Um, and when I, I decided I loved teaching, the idea of teaching, everybody I knew assumed that I, w I would want to be an elementary school teacher because I'm awesome with small children. And I knew that I wanted to do high school. I don't, again, I just trusted my instincts. And yeah. I love the career. I love teenagers. Love mm -hmm. them. And I still yeah. love them. Yeah. There's such a, um, there's such a hope and um, potential and this energy that is just such a wonderful place to be mm -hmm. uh, you know in my in my career the thousands and thousands of students that I taught I, ca I can't even fill one hand with students I genuinely didn't like oh like, for I sure. genuinely loved yeah. my students yeah. yeah so but it was unexpected everybody that knew me was like really Anita like high school like, why would you do high school so you know you got to trust that that gut so I fell into that like I, I was, I made the decision two weeks before the applications were due and had to write my essays and, and all mm -hmm. this stuff um, in a very short period of time. It was a very sudden thing. And then same thing with <laughs> the photography, the photography yeah. I kind of fell into it. Yeah. So um, I think it's, it's, it's trusting, it's trusting your own gut and also realizing that your decisions are reversible in many cases. 
And I think people well, think that, you know, I could have gone back into teaching if it didn't work out. You know, I might've sure. been embarrassed. I might've, you yeah. know, like, who knows? Well, but yeah. It was but that's that, that's that fear then of fear of what other people would think. Now you mentioned <laughs> something about people asking you about going into teaching high school. When I decided at 40 to go back to school, I had one person, one friend that thought I'd be a good teacher and it was a good thing to do. I had four kids to raise on my own. Most people thought I was absolutely insane to even think about doing that. And so sometimes it's what other people are thinking that might, well, we're ultimately responsible for our own choices, but they might, we might give them too much sway in that choice. So when people were surprised you were going into high school, um, it still, you, you know, you stayed to your course. So we can't live our lives according to other people, right? Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things is it's two things. One, knowing which of your people you can go to for which things. Yes. <laughs> so I know which people I go to where I go for unconditional support. And I know which people I go to that will just give me a little slap and say snap out of it. Anita. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I know my people yes. and, and I go to different people for different things. And we I need, need what I need at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. And you need all those kinds of people. Yeah. Right. Well, you have, but you I have think... built up, you have built up, not just maybe your closest friends that you'll share your innermost questions or desires or you know interests with but you've also built quite a nice community of people that you brought together through your own um oh your own magnetic personality that support one another like truly i mean i know we talk about uh, social media as being kind of like an iffy thing but the value that comes from people um people supporting one another you have a very supportive facebook group and it's so, been incredible. <laughs> They're like the nicest people on the internet. And so badass too, like nice and badass. Like I just oh, yeah. the best people well, in I this think, little community. Like the founder. I mean, a little bit of both mixed <laughs> in. I, I see your posts. And but it's it's the it's the place to go, especially during these times where we're limited in our personal interactions with people you still feel that warmth and that caring and that sharing in that group that you've created. So Anita, are, you know, we're coming up to a point where, you know, I mean, it's great. I can spend lots of time talking with you, but you're too busy. And I know that tell us, you know, for people that want to find you as a photographer and I will be the first to say, you know, I highly recommend you. And I, my hair, hair thing is I've got COVID hair. My, my nice flashy style has grown out and, I need to, I need to come back, but I will give you like 10 stars out of five. I'm so pleased you. with your work. How can other people find you? Well, I'm pretty easy to find. My business name is my actual name. So Anita Watkins Photography or Anita Watkins Portraits. Um, you can find me online. I have two websites, anitawatkins.com and anitawatkinsphotography.com and they're both interconnected. So you can just go to one and find the other. Um, I'm on Facebook. Uh, Anita Watkins Photography is my main business page. You can follow me there. Um, and if you're interested, there's an, the Anita Watkins VIP um, group that you can um, ask to join if you want to be part of this magnificent little secret corner of the internet. <laughs> And, uh, or you can message me and ask me. Um, that was what I was talking that. about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just beautiful. But it's just beautiful, right? And it's so funny and so kind and so warm. It's just a, a beautiful place to be. And I'm on Instagram as well, uh, Anita Watkins Photography. You can find me there, so follow me. And don't hesitate to call or message me, and I'd love to connect with you. And your studio is where? Where do you it's reside? It's in London. Where is it? London. Yeah, I'm in London, Ontario. Okay, so pretty local for most of us. Um, you know, who knows in today's internet world how far afield podcasts and, and internet messages and whatnot will go, but um, well worth the trip, well worth booking up to see you. And um, I so appreciate you taking the time and sharing your story because, I, like I said, I find it so inspiring. And my challenge to people is, like, live now. We don't know what tomorrow brings for any of us. Um, and to, to end up with poor health and no longer able to do any of the things that we thought we would do later, um, 
just it's such a sad way to end our our exciting days life is a gift and i know that you yeah. you have shared that sentiment with me anita you are vibrant you are alive and thank you so much for bringing that here today because um i think more people need to hear that what we create of ourselves our own lives is up to us and if we don't do it 100 percent. yeah well thank 100%. you so we always have the choice we do. We do. And, um, you know, I, I love the fact that you talked about the calling. If we hear that little small voice in our heads and it won't shut up, then maybe we should pay attention, right? So anyway, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. So All right. in closing, I would just like to say uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is, again, Mary McCartney, the host of Don't Die Before You're Dead. And let me say that today I challenge you to dare to live the life that you were meant to live. Take care and see you next time.